morning. The next case to come before the court is Gary Gooley um, v. Linda Hudson et al. Uh, both parties will have up to 15 minutes to present their arguments. The appellant may reserve up to five minutes for rebuttal. If you do plan to reserve time for rebuttal, just let me know as I will be keeping time uh, track of the time. The arguments are being recorded, so please introduce yourself, stay behind the podium, uh, keep your voices up. You should not use the names of children, minors, or victims. Should that be relevant to your argument, you can refer to those folks by their initials or generic terms. The judges have read your briefs and we're ready to proceed when you are, and I would ask the appellant at this time, would you like to reserve time for rebuttal? Yes, Your Honor, I'd like to reserve five minutes for rebuttal. Very well, then we are ready to begin when you are. Good morning. If it may please the court, I am John Oberholzer. I am uh, here on behalf of the uh, appellants. Uh, they are uh, Linda and Billy Hudson and a corporation taste of the summer LLC. The uh, uh, arguments we made are twofold. Uh, one is the argument that this is not an eviction, that uh, the statute for the eviction is very specific and that the defendants in this case are what I would call permissive users and uh, they are not either tenants or occupiers and that uh, the remedy pursued by the plaintiff in this case, eviction, uh, was improper and should have been dismissed. In looking at this, the question may occur as to why would the plaintiff pick an eviction and I would suggest to the court that what has happened in this case is by pursuing an eviction uh, the uh, plaintiff, in essence, uh, shifted the burden of proof uh, from the uh, to, to the Bewley, I'm sorry, to the Hudsons and the Taste of Summer LLC. Uh, my second uh, uh, assignment of argument has to do with the question of an easement for the Hudsons to get access to their their property. Um, I'm not sure what the uh, protocols are here, but. I do feel sometimes that a picture says a lot more than a thousand words. Uh, exhibit one of uh, Taste of Summer LLC is an aerial view uh, of the property in January of 2022. Um, I've made copies for everybody, but I wasn't sure that that was appropriate. But anyway, that aerial view demonstrates uh, pictorially exactly what the problem is. Um, the um, south part of the property um, uh, abuts a 60-foot strip that is owned by uh, the Hudsons. On the north is a 60-foot strip owned by the Hudsons. Uh, on the south strip, uh, a Taste of Summer LLC uh, erected a, uh, a farm stand, a, a produce stand, and that building pretty much occupied the, uh, the 60 foot to the south. Customers for the uh, farm stand were coming on Mr. Bewley's property uh, to park in order to come to the farm stand. He took umbrage with that, as well as the fact that he did not like the fact that uh, the Hudsons, um, who owned a U-Haul uh, franchise, were allowing their trucks to be parked on his property. That picture shows all of that. It shows that there are some customers parked on Mr. Bewley's property. It also shows on the north edge of the property that there are some U-Haul trucks that have their snouts extending over the property line. Now what happened in the trial is the trial court held that the, uh, the Bewley's had no easement of necessity to get to their house. And that's the problem. Uh, they were using the 60 feet to the south to get to their house, and in the exhibit you can see that that's pretty chopped up. Interestingly enough, and the reason why I call the court's attention to this exhibit, on the north edge of the property there is what appears to be, and is in fact, a perfectly acceptable easement for the Hudsons to drive to their property, which is in the east or back end of the diagram. However, half of that access transverses in the picture and the exhibit transverses Mr. Bewley's property. 
Now he shifts the burden of proof, so then it suddenly becomes the Hudson's responsibility to uh, prove by clear and convincing evidence that they're entitled to an easement of necessity. When in fact they did have a perfectly acceptable easement, it's just that Mr. Bewley didn't want them crossing his property, even though the evidence and the, the exhibit indicate that they have been able to do that for years. Uh, as it stands now, uh, with the court's order, it, it's really kind of impractical. It's forcing the, um, the Hudson's to access their property along the south edge, which you can see in the exhibit is uh, uh, less than acceptable when what appears to be and is a perfectly acceptable way on the north side, but the court said, no, you can't do that. So our second assignment of error is, is that there was evidence uh, that meets the standards for a uh, easement and necessity to get to their house. Uh, we would indicate to the court that um, this is really kind of a simplistic issue. They've been getting to their house through Mr. Bewley's property for years and years. He gets upset, <coughs> and I think the notice on the eviction, which I feel is uh, wrong, but it indicates what he's really upset about. He's upset about people parking on his parking lot, and he's upset that the U-Haul trucks extend the, their, their uh, parking on his, on his ground. He has a right to be upset about both those things, but does that then give him a right to shut down the Hudson's from getting to their property? And uh, we would argue that uh, it does not. So thank you very much. And I do believe I reserve a few minutes for you. I want to make, and then I'll entertain any questions. I hope this won't take too long um, for my points. First of all, this case is moved. Um, we fi I filed a motion to have it dismissed as moved. It is an eviction case. Um, the trial court um, sua sponte and rather graciously gave the Hudson's till October 31st prior to develop their own access to their own property. They did so. <laughs> That's kind of the, the kind of the part that got kind of swept under the rug under on, on Mr. Uh, Overholzer's presentation. Well, except that he said something that um, I thought was interesting. That uh, some of the um, complaint that he has is not that just that they were accessing their property over his property, but that they're still parking U-Hauls and so They've forth. They've been the, the uh, um, on. The, November 1st, the eviction order was executed by the sheriff, and they're not, they're, it's been fenced off, so they're not accessing it anymore. Okay. They're, they're, they are continuing to operate their business on their side of the property. They've put in a new curb cut, and they, they get to their own property on their own property now. So there's no access to the parking spaces. I know there was the issue of the fencing to begin with, but I didn't know if that had. Okay. So the case is moot. Um, it's moved on the even by necessity because they now have their own access well, to their own property. That your argument, obviously, fourth one from detainer. That's moot. You're saying because they have been right. uh, and, But we still have the even by necessity to look at. But are you saying that's moot because they now have their own separate? Access? I am. Okay, thank you. Um, so, defendant appealing a judgment of fourth one through detainer may overcome a ruling of mootness by obtaining a stay of execution or posting a supersedious bond. They did not do so. They moved the trial court, who's very familiar with the facts, for a, an extension of their um, of the time that they gave them through October 31st. The trial court denied it um, as unwarranted and unnecessary in light of the progress that they have made on <coughs> setting up, excuse me, setting up their own access. They did not take it up with the support. The, the eviction appeal is moot. Second. Um, Proceeding by way of a forceful entry of the Tanner action, it was proper in this case. Um, Mr. Overholzer's argument that this that the stat statute is somehow restricted to landlord-tenant situations only is incorrect, and it's contrary to the plain language of the statute. Um, <clears throat> revised Code 1923-02A5 and A6 permit a FED action to be brought against any person who is an occupier of lands or tenements without color of title and the complainant has 
the right of possession to them, or <clears throat> in any other case of the unlawful and forcible detention of lands and tenements. Um, the statute further, at revised code 1923.01c5, um, says that um, <clears throat> it, it can be applied to the revocation of any agreement that establishes the terms, conditions, rules, or other provisions concerning the use and occupancy or occupancy of premises by one of the parties to the agreement. <coughs> and the evidence at trial was that, yes, Mr. Buley had given them permission to use his parking lot under certain terms and conditions, one of which was that they not do anything that threatened his occupancy and use permit. Um, his, what, what set this off was the fact that they built a permanent structure and purported to um, piggyback on his parking spot in connection with that permanent <coughs> structure. It threatened Mr. Buley's business because it threatened the number of dedicated parking spots that he had for, on, for his own property. Um, they, violated the they violated the restriction that he put on their use of the parking lot, so he, he terminated their permission to use it, and they wouldn't go. <coughs> in terms of, in, in terms of um, the scope of the issues that were tried, um, again, the forcible entry detainer statute of 1923-061A specifically provides for the defendant in a forcible entry and detainer case to raise any defenses or counterclaims that they may wish um, that pertain to giving up possession. And that's exactly what they did. They raised a number of equitable defenses. They put, there were like 10 different labels they put on it. They filed a counterclaim saying that we, we should have a permanent easement. You can't throw us off. This was not a forcible one. This was not something that happened then, at, you know, three days later at the district court. It took a year to get to trial. There was a full-blown trial. They put on all of their defenses, and they were rejected on the merits. The main, main reason that they rejected on the merits with respect to the third point, the implied easement um, of necessity, is that there was no necessity. Um, all they had to do was to all they had to do to get access across their own property was to cut a curb, and they've done it. Um, the and that's what the judge realized. And in fact, the judge gave them over six months to go cut their own curb, and over the course of the summer, that's exactly what they did. Um, <clears throat> an easement by necessity is only available when somebody's landlocked, not when it's simply going to have cost them some money to improve their own property. So there is no the claim for an easement. Oh, implied necessity is frivolous. Um, thank you. If the court has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Any questions? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And you will have uh, the full five minutes for rebuttal. Thank you very much, Your Honors. There are three things I'd like to discuss by way of rebuttal. Uh, the uh, first question is that of mootness, and we would argue that uh, this is not moot, just the mere fact that uh, we would say this is not an eviction uh, and renders it not moot. Uh, the, the remedy that should have been pursued here, quite clearly, is some kind of a quiet title action, which if that's done, and it's done by the plaintiff, and he brings it as a quiet title action, the burden of proof is on the plaintiff to show that his title can be quieted. Uh, the principle behind an eviction is based on some form of contract, and we're saying there's no contract here whatsoever. Uh, he should have pursued an, an injunctive remedy. When you look at that exhibit, the, the, uh, the parking of the, on his parking lot by the customers of Taste of LL, uh, Summer LLC, we can agree, I think, is, is something that needs to be addressed and is probably wrong, but I don't know that that's a, and I'm arguing, it's not an eviction. Council, uh, I'm trying to figure this out. So what would be the difference between um, somebody parking in the parking space and you allowed them to and then you decide you didn't want them there anymore and you filed an eviction as opposed to uh, boyfriend lives with girlfriend and girlfriend decides she doesn't want him there anymore and he refuses to leave so she has to file an eviction to have him removed. Uh, well, I think the, the, uh, the difference, I think, is, a, is a, uh, first of all, the, the first is a commercial operation. The second is those people parking there shouldn't be there or they shouldn't be there now. I mean, our clients have, at this point, certainly, have nothing to do 
with why these people park there. They just drive in off the street. And, and that's what I think Mr. Bewley objected to, was that these customers were using his parking lot, uh, presumably without anybody's permission. In the example the court gave, I feel that, uh, that uh, there is at least some kind of a tangential relationship that led to, to that happening. And that may be a contractual uh, basis for an eviction, as this case is, we're talking about third parties who had a commercial relationship that possibly, if they bought anything, would taste of LLC. And so we're saying that's not eviction. If you read the notice that, that gave rise to all this, uh, the court can see that uh, the, the notice is, uh, we felt, defective in itself. But at any extent, we do feel this is not an appropriate eviction action. And going to the, um, the easement, I think the, the exhibit that I've referred to uh, lays it out pretty clearly. There is access to the north, but he didn't like that. Uh, Mr. Bewley did not like that. And so uh, the court, we would argue incorrectly, uh, prevented the Hudsons from getting to their property on what was a perfectly it's a perfectly uh, permissible way to get there. Council, so, I want to just go, uh, direct your attention back to um, your argument in respect to, you said, because this is not an eviction, therefore it cannot be moved. What is left that is not moved? I'm, I'm having a hard time understanding that. Uh, well, because I would argue that the, the, uh, the eviction well, first of all, I feel there's no uh, authority for the eviction, period. I mean, you shouldn't have brought it. Well, that happens, uh, but even with our regular municipal court evictions, uh, you know, it may be an unlawful eviction, but after it happens, we stay the mood all the time. Uh, and I, I would argue that, uh, that uh, uh, I would still argue against mootness. In that case, it might be moot in the municipal court. I can argue, see where it would be. This is a lot more than just a simple F.E. and D. eviction case. This led to uh, some property easements. If this case had been restricted to its initial basis, uh, I think there's a more a, a bigger argument for mootness. But in this case, this thing mushroomed into a lot more than uh, just possession. This uh, this led to the uh, the, the eviction in essence possessed the Hudsons of their ability to get to the property, which led to the counterclaims. And when you get there, you change the burden of proof. We feel this renders the whole thing not moot. And uh, we also would argue that the common pleas court should be uh, reversed. We'd argue that really the whole thing should just be dismissed, and it ought to be then restarted as a uh, quiet title. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you both for your presentations. The court will take the matter under advisement and issue a decision in due course. Uh, on the day that uh, the decision is released, the clerk of courts will mail a copy of it to you, and the opinions will also be posted on the Ohio Supreme Court website. And the court thanks you for your presentation.